All right. Hey, everybody. I want to welcome you to HNB Conversations with Cosmo and Rivka. Um, although Rivka is not in this conversation today, we're kind of changing things up a little bit. So normally she is the one that does the welcoming and all of that and her special um, uh, words for the day or things like that. But um, today we have a special guest, which is her dad, um, Dr. Ray Gannon. I'm going to call him dad. I'm not going to call him Dr. Gannon, although I will say when I first met him, that's what I called him because he was my professor uh, when I was in uh, seminary. And, um, and so Dr. Gannon is with us today and, uh, he's going to be, we're going to, we're going to going forward. We're going to be, uh, the, our conversations are not, is there going to be conversations with either sometimes Cosmo or Rivka with maybe a guest or some, somebody else, or it may be with Riv and I, um, and, uh, and then you can send in your questions. So we'd really love for you to send in your questions if there's something that you, because Dr. Gannon will be with us on further uh, later podcasts as well. And so if there are questions that you have, things that you want to ask, um, we invite you to send those in. Send it to podcast at shalomaz.com. And uh, so I just want to give you a brief introduction. Uh, um, is Dr. Gannon uh, actually was one of the... Um, pioneers of what we call the modern messianic movement um, in the early 70s. Uh, at a, and if I get this wrong, Dad, you can correct me. But in the early 70s, the, three different congregations launched independently, not knowing of each other at all at, in the East Coast, Midwest. In Gaithersburg, Maryland, in, in Chicago, and in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles. It was something. It was the work of the Holy Spirit. It was something God was doing. None of you were in coordination with, knew of one another, but at the same time, you were doing something that was revolutionary. Well, the other two in Gaithersburg, Maryland, and in Chicago, they may have known of each other. Okay. Uh, um, but uh, but you know what? I'm sorry. Let me. I thought back it was Cincinnati. Up. No. That's right. I was just going to correct myself. Okay. It was Gaithersburg, Maryland, and. Cincinnati. Right. Now, it probably was true that both of those fellows uh, would have known each other, uh, Ma uh, Man Manny Brotman and uh, Martin Chernoff. But uh, when we were in Los Angeles uh, in 1973, I had no awareness of those people or what they were doing or anything about them. We just felt sovereignly led of the Lord to begin a Messianic synagogue which we did then in 1973. What was so so? I mean, I know obviously a lot of the the story, but but kind of maybe talk us through the the beginning of what you were experiencing at that point that as that the prompted you to to go. I mean, this was completely revolutionary. This was something that maybe talk even a little bit about the pushback that you received at the when you began to bring this up to people in leadership when we first. Uh, engaged in Jewish evangelism in, in Los Angeles, uh, like in 1970, uh, we had no idea that we would ever be creating anything like a Messianic synagogue. In fact, we were advised by our denomination, don't even think about ever having anything like a Jewish church per se, because they were just uh, really turned off to the whole uh, idea of that. It appeared that it was Judaizing, it would be uh, too much, you know, Jewishness, it was incompatible with the scriptural uh, program and so forth. So I had no, no idea at all of beginning uh, anything like a Messianic synagogue, but over the course of time, as we were winning with the, with the help of the Holy Spirit, uh, and, and we were moving in a Jewish cultural way, Jewish people felt the freedom to embrace the Messiah, because he was presented to them in a way the Jewish people could hear the gospel and respond favorably to it. We were winning so many Jewish people to the Lord, and there was such a, a outpouring of the Holy Spirit, where the gifts of the Spirit were in operation and, and uh, disciples were being made in great number. Um, but uh, we had a problem, and that is we felt like if people were really going to be discipled, it meant a lot more than just say, and invite Yeshua to come and live in your heart. Right. I mean, that was a, uh, that was a bit uh, 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 small-minded. It, it really wasn't consistent with what Yeshua was talking about when he said, make disciples. Right. If, if you're going to make a disciple, 
you really have to have somebody who is committed to a congregation, who, who is a part of a community, who has people to whom he's accountable, that develops a good spiritual life, right. that interacts with people and serves other people within the community. Uh, and uh, so to do that, of course, uh, a new believer, a new Jewish believer, has to be a part of a congregation and salute the pastor and uh, go along with whatever's happening with the congregation. The problem was that uh, about half of the people that we were winning to the Lord were able to make that cultural leap. In other words, they were able to go into a four-square church or into an Assemblies of God church, perhaps even a Baptist church, and they could uh, bite their tongue and they could live with some of the things that may be problematic for Jewish people culturally within a non-Jewish environment. But then there was the other half. Right. The other half that said, you know, uh, we, we really like the pastor. He's a wonderful speaker. When, what a wonderful choir. They sing so beautifully. And the pews are padded so comfortably. But, you know, I'm Jewish. And I need something that's really Jewish. So I'm sorry. I can't just, you know, go along with something like that. Right. Something kind of visceral, like, in their being that goes, I, this, this goes against everything that, of my identity. Yeah. I mean, it was so uncomfortable. It was so foreign. It was so strange. It, it wasn't something that about half of the believers could manage to, to live with. So o over the course of time, of course, we were starting Bible studies across greater Los Angeles. We, we had them we had five or six different Bible studies meeting on a weekly basis, every one of them bringing people to faith every week. Mm -hmm. you know, so the, it, the thing was really swelling and growing. But uh, again, we weren't really fulfilling our responsibility towards the other half. Right. And so we finally felt like we probably should consider having something like a Messianic synagogue where people could wear yarmulkes, where there could be a Torah scroll that was read, where we could have Hebrew prayers interspliced with the uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit in full operation, with healing lines, uh, with the word of prophecy or a word of knowledge. And these things combining together to be a Holy Spirit-filled atmosphere, but in a, a Jewish cultural framework. Right. And we soon discovered this, that um, the Holy Spirit was never grieved by our Jewishness. Mm. The Holy Spirit was never quenched by our Jewishness. That was never a problem as far as the Holy Spirit was concerned. Now, sometimes we had visiting friends or denominational officials <laughs> or educators or other Christians that would come into the atmosphere, and they may be quenched. You know? right, right. They may be grieved, but uh, it never bothered the Holy Spirit. So uh, in that arena, we were able to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. He was able to pour out of his spirit upon us, and we saw great miracles take place, and a, a continuing advance of the kingdom of God in the Jewish community. So that was in, that was in 1973. Right, and so at the time, right, you've got... Where within denominations, they're comfortable with, you know, what, like, what, like there was an author, Martin Hodges, who wrote a book called The Indigenous uh, Principle. And they're, com they're comfortable with going to different people, people groups, and meeting them in their culture. And yet there was somewhat of a resistance within certain, uh, just it, it, within denominational leadership uh, to applying that principle in, a Jewish, in the Jewish world. You know, I mean, this is what we, this is a problem that we ran into in Southern California because although, you know, we were able to get appointments and we were able to begin our Jewish ministry, there was no real understanding of Jewish ministry or what it was going to take to effectively disciple a larger number of Jewish people. So when we really began to move in a congregational direction, uh, where we were wearing yarmulkes and we were doing Hebrew and we were, you know, mm. all, all of these things. It just was so foreign to them. It was so foreign to the Christians that they were having the same visceral reaction right. to it in the opposite direction. Uh huh. And so uh, we, we decided at, at some point, well, we really have to go 
with, with what the needs of our target group is. Our target group, are, are, are the, the people that we're trying to reach, are the Jewish people. Mm-hmm. Uh, Assemblies of God people or Baptists or four square people, they've got all uh, hundreds of places Pick where they church. can go. <laughs> yeah, they're everywhere. <laughs> but we needed to have something that would be uniquely for Jewish people. And so we, we created that kind of congregation and uh, God blessed us in a tremendous way. And this, I mean, this was happening at a time that, um, th- I mean, this is happening at a time where, like, the Jesus movement is going on, uh, right? The, what was it? The Jesus people, or what? What was the language used at the time? Well, you this? had you had in the fifties. You know, you had the healing movement, and the healing movement uh, uh, launched basically the charismatic renewal movement. And, of course, the Jesus movement was launched in the 60s, and it would continue into the 70s. And uh, in that environment, there, were, w- w- there was tremendous moving of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jewish people were being drawn. And, of course, there, there was awareness across the nation. Right. There was great awareness that revival was taking place. There was tremendous moving of the Holy Spirit in all kinds of circles, including the Jewish world. Right. So there was a lot of curiosity that was being generated. So when we were out now conducting Bible studies uh, in, in Jewish homes and Jewish neighborhoods, when we were on witnessing in university campuses, or we were out in the streets witnessing to, to Jewish people, there was a, a readiness among a certain percentage of these people to give the gospel a fair hearing. And of course, we were trained now, we trained ourselves basically, right. to be effective spokesmen for the gospel, speaking in a, in a Jewish manner to Jewish people, and uh, found that they were very, very responsive. So, yeah, so, so you were, I mean, you were young. You were, uh, 1973, you're 25 years old Yeah. for part of the year. <laughs> you're 24, 25 years old. Right. You've gotten your bachelor's degree at that point, and you've, you, you're, you're not Jewish at all and then like you're where did you learn for instance where did you learn the liturgy where did where did you begin to um immerse yourself into learning the liturgical pieces and and i mean you just kind of dove in but what did that look like well we should back up when i was in bible college bethany bible college i was a bible major so that was a very very important major going into Jewish ministry. Mm-hmm. But but secondly, I was a missions minor. So I learned a lot about the indigenous principle. Right. And uh, what I soon discovered was that in, in widespread uh, evangelism ac- around the world, everybody was in- employing the indigenous principle, but it was suitable for all groups of people except the Jews. <laughs> So the Jews were not permitted to be themselves. They were not permitted to be self-governing, to be self-supporting, right. you know, uh, and, and so self-theologizing, which is the fourth element to the three-pronged uh, brand. Uh, and uh, so we, we challenged that. We said, no, we, we really feel that the indigenous principle applies to the Jewish world, to the Jewish community, as well as it does to everybody else in the universe. So why should the Jews be the only ones who cannot retain their, their culture? Why should the Jewish people be the ones who have to commit social harry carry oh. and uh, abandon their I- identity, or commit uh, a social suicide in order to serve the Lord? Right. Uh, that's not going to happen in the ministry that we're doing. So this is what gave rise then. But that was revolutionary. Oh, very revolutionary. In fact, I'll tell you how revolutionary it was. When, when we, were, we were starting this, of course, this is now 1973, there were a number of Jewish ministries across the United States that had been around for a long time. And, I mean, like 100 years. Right. And they had uh, you know, little Bible studies that they would do, or they would do little Passover services, or they would be speaking in churches, or they would, you know have little kinds of, but they never really won very many Jewish people to the Lord. I mean, they, if they, in fact, I remember one missionary to the Jews working with the, uh, one ministry that I won't name told me that I should be happy 
if we want one Jewish person a year to the Lord. Mm. Well, you know, now I'm 23, 24, 25 years old. <laughs> Somebody's telling me that. This, uh, I went to prayer. Uh-huh. I said, God, if this is what I'm to expect, I'm bailing out right now. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I just can't imagine just winning one or two Jewish people a year to the Lord. You've got to help me. You've got to bless me. You've got to anoint me. You've got to give me fruit right. if I'm going to be in this ministry. And as we pressed in like that uh, and, uh, and applied the indigenous principles, we're culturally sensitive to Jewish people. Uh, we found that uh, Jewish people would respond to the gospel and they would come to faith as readily as anybody else. And they, and they, and they fell in love with the Lord just like everybody else did. Right. They became solid kingdom of God's citizens even as everybody else would with all of their Jewish identity. But you know, I'm, I and and I'm curious. I mean, just this is a point of personal curiosity. I imagine others might be curious, but I'm generally genuinely curious about. I mean, there was a lack of resource um, at the time. Like, if someone now goes into Jewish ministry, there's so much you can read. You know, there's so much you can you can look at online. You can oh, what does this sound like? What is it? But there was like, it was. Okay, you studied uh, the indigenous principle, but then, then like, where did you? How did you begin to immerse yourself in that, in your own understanding of the culture? What did you, like, um, where did you like? Is it? I mean, were there were there things you could listen to in a library, or did you go to the, <laughs> to the synagogue? You know, um, to 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 discover these uh, the things that you would then apply. Well, we well we were in Bible College in Santa Cruz, California. We did go to a local synagogue there, where where uh, my wife at, uh, was. Uh, we were engaged at the time, but she was working as a custodian in the local synagogue. So we had minimal exposure mm. there, and I had met Jewish people during my high school years, uh, but that didn't uh, begin to prepare us at all for right. what, we, what we would be facing living in the middle of Los Angeles with its 535,000 Jewish people. I mean, it's a very strong Jewish world there. Uh, but uh, what I found myself needing to do now was simply to get into reading. Mm. So I read everything I, I could find. I read, I read novels. I, I read history. I read about Judaism. I, I, I read everything that I possibly could to where I began to think as much as possible like a Jewish person would. Right. Like, like a Los Angelino would, would a Jewish Angelino would be thinking. Right. And so that uh, was reinforced then as a, a, or refined, I should say, not only re- reinforced, but refined as I interacted with Jewish people. Right. And I found these things that I was learning were, were key to understanding Jewish people and uh, e- equipping so that I was able to communicate the word effectively to them. You know, it's funny, it's, as he talks about that, you know, he was my professor in grad school. And um, one thing you knew, I had a friend one time that took some friends that, um, that took three Gannon classes in one semester. It was a bad idea to take three Gannon classes in one <laughs> semester because what he would do, he would assign so much much reading i mean he was like immerse yourself in the library get lost in the library because that's what he did and he threw himself into it and 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 read so much and so he was like i'm gonna give you guys this gift as well i remember uh the shavers and <laughs> being in like three classes one one semester anyway and by the way in case you don't know um uh, dr gannon has um he has two PhDs. He got his first one from the California Graduate School of Theology in 1976, and then uh, many years later uh, got the got a PhD in history. He is a, a historian, a PhD from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem in Israel. So when you hear him begin to talk about church history, uh, when he begins to talk about what happened in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, and he could, of course, go way before that and, and after that, um, he is an expert in the field, and so I just wanted to to make mention of that. So, so what we so the thing is the whole the whole launching of the messianic movement was 
was very pragmatic in purpose. It was evangelistic in purpose. The the reason is to is to to have a messianic congregation is to have a place where Jewish people uh, can come that is Jewish friendly but Yeshua centered. Absolutely, this was the whole dimension. It was a practical move. We had to have an atmosphere. We had to have an arena where Jewish people could be discipled as Jews. Right. Right. We weren't going to re- re- require them to become ham-eating Pentecostals. Right. <laughs> and, you, well, and you know, the, you know the, the, the thing that, uh, that strikes me, though, in the midst of you're doing all of this reading, right? You're immersing yourself um, in, in under, getting the mindset with increasing clarity of the people that you're trying to reach. Um, but in the midst of that, the Lord was working really powerfully through you and mom in the midst of your own, what you would feel like inadequacy. I mean, you probably, I imagine felt overwhelmed by, uh, at times you hear you're 23, 24, 25 years old. And yet, and yet, you know, the, the Holy Spirit was working powerfully in, through you. They were seeing things they never imagined or knew were possible. You know, I mean, you asked about, uh, you know, throwing ourselves into this ministry. And I'll just give you one example uh, of this. Here we were just young people. I mean, you know, 23, 24 years old. And I remember that uh, Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, was was coming and uh of course you know how do you get ready for a rosh hashanah uh, service how how are you going to interact with the jewish people around the jewish new year because this of course is is one of the high holy days and on the uh, 10 days later is yom kippur the day of atonement and these represent these 10 days the days of awe what does all that mean in the jewish world and so we prepared a little Maxor, which is kind of a prayer book for the High Holy Days. Mm-hmm. And um, we went, at, and we, we were meeting in a large Jewish home in Beverly Hills. Okay. And we must have packed into that place that night, I don't know, 60 or 70 Jewish people. And uh, we went, we had, a, wow. we had a Rosh Hashanah service. Now, bear in mind, I had never been to a Rosh Hashanah so that's, service. Right, that's my question. That's what I can't like. Like, where? Like, I you taught me liturgy. Like, I had someone giving me the tunes, helping me with the order. Yeah. You didn't. That wasn't available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we but but the, uh, this Rosh Hashanah service, um, we had so many Jewish people come. And here we were going through this liturgy, the Rosh Hashanah service, the liturgy. Right. And uh, then I preached, and we had three Jewish people come to faith. Man, you tripled the yearly output of many <laughs> Jewish yeah, ministries. Right. We, had, <laughs> we had three Jewish people out of this larger group come to a born-again experience in Yeshua. And I remember going home that night, and I was exhausted because of the tremendous amount of energy that went out for something like this. Mm-hmm. But I got home last, that, that night, and I, I laid down on my couch, and I just began to laugh with joy. Right Here, I, I'd never been to a Rosh Hashanah service in my life. We, we were struggling to make our way through this thing. And yet the God moved in such a way that three Jewish people came to faith in Yeshua. Right. And, and it really was always the case. It was always the case. As, as, we were, as we were ministering the word and the Holy Spirit was moving, it was always the case where I felt like I needed to stay out of the way. I needed to stay out of the way because of what God was doing by his spirit. Right. It, wasn't, it wasn't us. It really was God moving, and we just wanted to be an instrument in his hands. He was doing the surgery. Right. He was doing all of the ministry, and we just wanted to be pliable in, in, in his own hands. 
And uh, when we manage to stay out of the way and let the Lord have his way in our midst on the Jewish world, we saw all this wonderful Jewish fruit. Oh, my. Well, you know, um, how long, Antonio, how long have we been going? Uh, 20 minutes. Okay. I, I just, I, because uh, I want to continue to have this conversation and kind of even, I think, I don't know, I think um, it is a special opportunity for anybody that's listening uh, to to hear some of the beginnings of, you know, we, we see things now, but you hear the beginning and, and it's inspiring. It's like, uh, I mean, again, it's so cool to me. I mean, you're one of the founders of the movement. I know that, but the spirit of the Lord is the one who's moving in the midst of it. It's a, it's a great privilege for us to be able to hear these things. But even as I'm, as I'm listening to you tell a story, the, the key principle that keeps being reiterated has to do with like you gave your everything which is what we're called to do but it wasn't your everything that brought people to the lord your everything was your act of obedience it was your two fish and five loaves but it was it was the lord that provided all of this increase in our inadequacy right it doesn't mean we we don't go in and just sit back and say okay lord do it we throw everything in but he's the one that does it, and um, and I think a lot of people, our tendency is to wait. I'll do this when I feel fully qualified. Hmm. Yeah, that's a big mistake. Right. It's a big mistake. <laughs> I'll do this when I feel fully prepared, mm-hmm. and and you can end up waiting and doing nothing. That's right. That's right. No, you have to... You have to just have an ear to hear the voice of the Spirit and a readiness to take up your cross and follow Him and then just let Him guide you and you will become a fruitful person. Yeah. I think, and I think, you know, from the stories that that a lot of the people that you you led to the Lord were elderly people. Yeah, that's true because in Los Angeles, of course, in those years, there were so many New Yorkers who had moved out to the better climate. Right. And uh, so, you know, a, lo- a tremendous m- number of J- Jewish people in Los Angeles in those days were f- former New-, New Yorkers and were retirees. Mm-hmm. So here we were, we were ministering across the board, of course, to people of all ages, but we had a, a, a very sizable number of elderly people, elderly Jews. And the, the w- amazing thing was, as these elderly Jews would raise their hands and worship and praise the Lord, and the tears would roll off their faces, people their grandchildren's age would would come into the meetings and say, "These are my grandparents. Right. These these are my grandparents' age people coming to Yeshua. I have to consider this. Right. And then they would also come into a place of faith. Wow. So we were multi generational. And, we were able to win more than one generation at a time, and so and, and at times these the the elderly folks they didn't. I think they saw even in your, I imagine that they saw in your greenness. They had they were moved by there was a tenderness toward you. They saw you with through eyes of tenderness. They they, they looked at you like you were grandkids to them. Well, that's very true. That's very true. I think people were very kind to us. Uh, they uh, they understood one thing: how much we loved them. Right. They knew that we loved them, and we knew they they knew that we only had their best interests in, in mind. Right. And uh, they had confidence that we were giving them the love of God. Right. We we were presenting the truth to them. And uh, they were so happy to be responding. Because that's the part you can't afford to get wrong. Yeah, You can get a pronunciation wrong. But it's the, don't get the part wrong where they know you love them and have their best interests in mind. Well, that's right. Where that's what's, co- you can, you know what I mean? Like, they, I'm sure they snickered at times at the way you may have pronounced things or sang, sung things. Maybe when they saw you kind of do different things in services that... You know, there may have been times where they were like, okay, you know, but 
as you were growing? Did any of them kind of come alongside and give you kind of tips at times when you were a kid? Well, I, I have to tell you, there was a lady by the name of Molly Haberman who was, who was raised as an Orthodox Jewish lady. And I, I went to her and I said, Molly, you know, we're going we're gonna to begin now a Messianic synagogue. I mean, we, she was playing piano for us at our Bible studies and we were all singing Israeli songs um, our people would, you know, sometimes get to getting to dance a little bit, you know, because they're Jewish. Right. Dancing is very natural to, to Jewish people. So they would be, you know, kick up their heels a little bit and they'd be, it'd, it'd be, you know, dancing, Israeli style dancing and all the, all of that. But now when we're going to transition from a Bible study, which is a weekday event to a Shabbat service, which is a weekend event, the mm -hmm. Holy Day Shabbat. Right. Uh, you have to have the liturgy now. And uh, I went to her and I said, Molly, I need you to teach me the liturgy. Oh, okay. And so Molly sat down with me, the, the pianist. She sat down with me and I had the liturgy and we learned it. She taught me the liturgy as she's pounded away on the piano. So I love the order of that. So, so you didn't have the liturgy and you... You threw yourself into ministry. You did everything you could, but you didn't have all of that stuff. And you led these people to the Lord. And then the people you led to the Lord gave you the tools for step two. That's right. That's super cool, Dad. That's really, I love that. I love that. I think there's so much that if we will all, you know, like if we will all let the Holy Spirit work in us, and we stop waiting, like in our community group, stop waiting for something to be easy for us and put ourselves into the place that we feel the Lord calling us, into that place of giving of ourselves. The Lord will take our inadequacy and multiply it. See, the, the, the reason we're not seeing more Jewish people come to faith today is to a large measure because... The Christian world is made up of unbelievers. Now, let me say what I mean by that. Sure. The Christian world does not believe that Jewish people are going to be responsive to the gospel. Mm. They've been programmed to think that any hope of Jewish people coming to the Lord is off in the utopian future somewhere. Right. You know, when, 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 when Yeshua comes back, you know, and, and, and there's the millennial kingdom. And that's when Jewish people are going to get serious about Yeshua. And so there is no expectation. There's no faith being exercised for the salvation of Jewish people. But if you go out with conviction that the Lord really wants these Jewish people. He, he really loves these Jewish people. He wants them to know him. There's got to be a way to get through to them. The Holy Spirit is going to just superintend things. He'll show up and heal people if necessary or speak through one of the gifts of the Spirit to them with a word that just compels them to understand the truth of what you're saying. Right. Then the, if you go out in faith and exercise faith and practice your your evangelistic ministry with Jewish people, you find that they will respond. Right. God will move in a dramatic way. But, you know, God wants all Jewish people to be saved. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But he has to have believers to work with him. Right. He's going to have people that will put their faith in, in what he wants to do. He wants Jewish people to be saved. Why won't we just believe, exercise our faith, come alongside God in that effort to bring these people to faith? Yeah. And as we do that, he will bring them in a great number. Oh, that's wonderful. That's what we that's inspirational to all of us. I think that uh, we need to let the Lord um stir us, speak to our hearts and um and let the Holy Spirit convict us. You know, yesterday's or I don't know, today's Sunday. Um, but yesterday's message was about letting he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the spirit is saying to us. What's the, what's the soil of our hearts? You know, uh, we talked about yesterday. And so that's where the question is, um, if the spirit, of, as the spirit of the Lord is planting seed right now is 
to to stir us and to spur us on to do what God's called us to do, um, is it going to find good ground in us that will spring forth with fruitfulness? And that's our prayer. I, thanks, Dad, for for uh, being here for this today. My pleasure. And uh, we're going to do it again, and uh, we'll talk some more about maybe some of the things that we've seen the, for good and for areas of concern even uh, through the decades now, uh, five decades later. Um, and uh, five decades, good grief. Well, I guess because Rivka was born the year after you started. She was born right in, all, in the midst of all of yeah, this. Really... And uh, she's coming up on 50 this coming year. So anyway, all right. Well, hey, everybody, thanks for uh, joining in with us. Please be sure to send in a question, to, uh, your questions to us. And your questions, if you have questions for Dr. Gannon, um, send them to podcast at shalomaz.com. And, uh, and uh, we look forward to being with you next week. Until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom, shalom. Have a beautiful day.